Okay, so if we do, uh, if we look quickly here at this class, and I'm going to do a quick overview for you of uh, what we cover. So I've been teaching this uh, course on and off for since 2017. I developed a curriculum. I'm a historian. I've been studying um, 31 years now, 31 years, going on 32 years. And I developed, I put together all the slides. We cover about uh, 80 to 100. Um, there's about 80 to 100 articles that we reference in the class. And there's seven or eight books that we also use uh, in the class as reference. Okay. So you don't have to buy any of the books uh, to follow along. And I'm going to show you some of the slides here. You don't have to follow any, you don't have to buy any of the books to follow along. We show you the, um, the text right on the screen. Okay. But you can get them for your own uh, library. All right. So we talk about everything from Dink Nesh, um, who dates back about 3.2 million years ago, Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus afarensis, who uh, was the early form of uh, uh, humans. Found discovered in 1974 by Dr. Donald Johansson in Ethiopia. We talk about who M. Hotep uh, was, as well, one of the greatest, greatest people who ever lived in human history. And we, we deal with how the because of this whole 1619 phenomenon, and partly because of the 1619 project, so many African Americans are focused on 1619. Well, much of what we've been told about Virginia's first African Americans, August 20, 1619, is wrong. Uh, number one. Number two, Africans were here in this land we call the United States of America, going back tens of thousands of years. These were the first African people here. Uh, and our history does not start in slavery in the land we call the United States of America or what many Native Americans call Turtle Island. Now, also going back to um, 15, uh, 1526 in the South Carolina, Georgia area, you had um, the Spanish who took 100 Africans into that South Carolina, Georgia area. Those Africans are going to overthrow their oppressors. That was um, Louis de Alon, uh, who wanted to set up a settlement there. And they're going to go live with the Native Americans. They overthrow their oppressors. There's an article from Washington Post. Before 1619, that was 1526, the mystery of the enslaved, of the first enslaved Africans and what became the United States. Okay. So we go through and look at this history chronologically. All right. Uh, and we deal with the African presence in the Americas going back at least 50,000, um, 51,700 years ago. And the research from Dr. David M. Hotep in his book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. We look at the um, discovery from Dr. Albert Goodyear in 2004 in Allendale County, South Carolina. And Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina, uh, they discovered they found 13 different pieces of evidence, 13 different pieces of evidence or types of evidence that thoroughly documented an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, genetic M174D halfway groups dealing with DNA and genetics. They found, um, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting an African presence dating back at least 51,700 years ago. So this doesn't mean that the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. It just means that African people were here for tens of thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade happened. And it started with the Portuguese in 1441. Okay, going into uh, the area that's modern-day Mar uh, Mauritania. Uh, this is a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. This article is from uh, November 18, 2004, sciencedaily.com. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. And it talks about his discovery. And the, the evidence was, was from the Khoisan. Okay, the Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet that the ancestors that I knew in the Twa, they, they come from Southern Africa. 
an October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago at, at least. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically uh, unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Now, here are two uh, uh, Khoisan women. They're the short-statured Africans, okay, the ancestors to Dainua and Natwa. Now, the Khoisan live mainly in uh, uh, southern Africa in territory spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are uh, largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, or the Sans people, and keepers of the livestock called the Khoi Khoi people. Now, Sarah Bartman, or, or, or Sartage, uh, Hottentot Venus, as she was derisively called, who was, um, who was sold to a freak show in the early 1800s in England and traveled throughout England and in France. She was Khoisan, she was Khoi Khoi, okay? The Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds that aren't found in the languages of their neighbors. There was an article from AtlantaBlackStar.com called Five Ethnic Groups That Proved That the First uh, Humans were, were Black. Okay, now we talked about Sarah Bartman in our class uh, on uh, this past Saturday, okay, July 8th. So as soon as you register for the class and visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, you can watch that full two-hour class. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded, and uh, you can go back and watch it anytime. So even after the 12-week online course is over with, you still have uh, uh, full access to uh, the class. All right, so we talked about uh, Sarah Bartman, and uh, we talked about the, there's an article from, uh, well, there's one from blackpast.org. Uh, there's also information from the BBC. I was looking at uh, articles from the BBC as well um, on Sarah Bartman also. Uh, the, the, the one from the BBC is called The Significance of uh, Sarah Bartman, The Significance of Sarah Bartman. And it has drawings of her because um, photography, she dies in uh, about 1815. So uh, photographic camera, that wasn't invented till the late 1820s by John DeGore type. Okay, the DeGore type camera. Uh, if we look at this here, let's see. Let's go to this article from the BBC, bbc.com, the significance of Sarah Bartman, January 7, 2016. So she had large buttocks, okay? She had a vulva that uh, drooped down. And when she, when she died, her sexual organs were uh, put on display in the Paris Museum, okay? When she died, in, uh, she dies in, in 1815. OK, she died at 26 years old. Her brain, skeleton and sexual organs remained on display in a Paris museum until 1974. Her remains were repatriated and, bur and buried uh, until 2002. So it's going to be Nelson Mandela, who was Khoisan as well, who's going to call for her remains to be brought back home and buried in South Africa. All right. Two centuries ago, Sarah Bartman died after years spent in European freak shows. OK, now rumors over a possible Hollywood film about Bartman's life has sparked controversy. So so the film. So originally some rumors started that Beyonce was going to do a film about Sarah Bartman. But her uh, spokespeople said that's not true. OK, so let's not get caught up on that. Brought to Europe seemingly on false pretenses by a British doctor. She was stage named the Hottentot Venus. She was paraded around freak shows in London and Paris with crowds invited to look at her large buttocks. Today, some black women put on freak shows on stage and call it hip hop. Today, Sarah Bartman is seen as by is, is by many as the epitome of colonial ex exploitation and 
racism, the epitome of colonial exploitation and racism of the ridicule and commodification of black people or the commodification of the sexuality of black people, of African people. Um, Bar Sarah Bartman's life was one of huge hardship. It is thought she was born in South Africa's Eastern Cape in 1789. Her mother died when she was uh, two years old and her father was a cattle driver. Uh, he died when she was an adolescent. She entered domestic service in Cape Town after a Dutch colonist murdered her fiance. She was 16 years old. A Dutch colonist murdered her fiance. And then she's going to be sold into slavery. In October, 1810, although illiterate, Sarah Bartman allegedly signed a contract with English ship surgeon, William Dunlop and mixed race entrepreneur, Hendrik Caesars or Caesar Caesars in whose household Sarah Bartman worked, saying she would travel to England to take part in shows. The reason was that Sarah Bartman, also known as Sarah or Sartje, Sartje, S-A-R-T-J-I-E, Sartje, she had what was called stetopegia, stetopegia, S-T-E-A-T-O-P-Y-G-I-A. And this resulted in extremely uh, protuberant buttocks due to a buildup of fat. She had very large buttocks that white people made fun of and poet pointed at and jeered at. She also had very large breasts and they were fascinated with uh, the skin on the outside of her vagina as well. So we see the sexual commodification of African women. These made her a case of fascination when she was exhibited at a venue in London's Piccadilly Circus after her arrival. Quote, you have to remember that at the time it was highly fashionable and desirable for women to have large bottoms. So lots of people envied what she had naturally without having to accentuate her figure. End quote, said Rachel Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S, author of The Hot and Top Venus, The Life and Death of Sartre G. Bartman. On stage, she wore skin tight, flesh colored clothing, as well as beads and feathers and smoked a pipe. Wealthy customers paid for private demonstrations in their homes with their guests allowed to touch her. So this could be looked at maybe like as the first. She, now, I wouldn't. She performed in freak shows, but this is like um, having a private stripper in your in your home or something like that. OK, not calling her a stripper, but it's it's like similar. Her arrival in England coincided with speculation over whether Lord Grenville and his coalition of Whigs, W-H-I-G-S, which was a political party known as the Broad Bottoms because of Greenville's own large behind, would try to seize government. This was a gift for cartoonists. One creation entitled A Pair of Broad Bottoms shows Greenville, Grenville and Bartman standing back to back with another figure measuring their respective posterior sizes. This, this, this uh, caricature, caricature here. Sarah Bartman's promoters nicknamed her the Hottentot Venus with Hottentot now seen as derogatory, then being used in Dutch to describe the Khoi Khoi and San people that we described are the oldest people on the face of the earth, the Khoi San. 
they together make up the peoples known as the Khoisan. And there's evidence of them being here in the U.S. going back at least 51,700 years ago, which is the discovery that Dr. Albert Goodyear made in 2004 in Allendale County, South Carolina, which Dr. David M. Hotep documents in his book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence. That is, that's one of the books we use in our class. And I've interviewed Dr. David M. Hotep about 13 times. He's a friend of mine. The British Empire had abolished the slave trade in 1807. Now, they got involved in 1562. And they abolished it after being involved something like 274 years, something like that. Because they they, uh, they allowed it, to, you, could, you could still own African slaves up until 1833. So they were involved for something like 274 years. They want credit for ending it. Why did you get involved in 1562 with Sir John Hawkins and the good ship Jesus? That's my question. You don't get credit for something that you allow to go on for 274 years. Now you want to pat on the back. Even so, campaigners were appalled at Sarah Bartman's treatment in uh, London. Her employers were prosecuted for holding Sarah Bartman against her will but not convicted with Sarah Bartman herself testifying in their favor in court. Cause there was a court case. The abolitionists were trying to get her freed and her owner produced a, a, a signed contract, even though she was illiterate saying, you know, Hey, she agreed to this. Quote, the question remains was Sarah Bartman coerced as abolitionists, humanitarian campaigners claimed or was she acting on her own free will? End quote, says uh, Christopher Petley, P-E-T-L-E-Y, a history lecturer at Southampton University. Quote, if she was coerced, she might have felt too intimidated to tell the truth in court. We'll never know. End quote. Okay. Read the rest of this here. Okay. She dies 26. Uh, the reports that she became uh, a prostitute as well. Uh, she drank and smoked heavily and according to Holmes was probably prostituted by him. Okay. Uh, in 1814, Sarah Bartman moved to Paris with Cesar's Cesar's. She became a celebrity once more drinking at the cafe de Paris and attending society parties. Cesar's returned to South Africa and Sarah Bartman came under the influence of an animal exhibitor, quote unquote, animal exhibitor with the stage name uh, Rox, R-E-A-U-X. She drank and smoked heavily and according to Holmes was probably prostituted by Rox, but well, uh, uh, prostituted by, um, that have been Cesar's, probably prostituted by Cesar's. Bar Sarah Bartman agreed to be studied and painted by a group of scientists and artists but refused to appear fully naked before them, arguing that this was beneath her dignity, arguing that this was beneath her dignity. She had never done this in one of her shows. This period was the beginning of the study of what became known as racial science, says Holmes. Now, Sarah Bartman died at age 26. Uh, the cause was described as inflammatory and eruptive disease. It's since been suggested this was a result of pneumonia, syphilis, or alcoholism. Read, read the rest of this article. We, we talked about her in our class on Sunday, okay? Ancient Egypt, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade. Read this article, The Significance of Sarah Bartman. This is from uh, BBC.com. Okay, now, um, so we get deep into this history. It's a 12-week online course. We deal with thousands of years of history. It's about 24... Uh, about 24 hours of course content, um, uh, maybe more, because I also include interviews I've done with uh, some of our scholars as well. Uh, Renoko Rashidi, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, Anthony Browder, um, Dr. David M. Hotel. We include interviews I've done with them also. All right, now let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation. These are some of the actual slides from the class. Visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, and you can... Um, a register for this online course. So we look at numerous archaeological discoveries that have come out in about the last 15 years get, that are causing us to rethink everything. And 
uh, when these discoveries come out, they, they're causing the scientists and anthropologists, et cetera, to push the timelines back. OK, this discovery here uh, that dealt with stone tools found on the Greek island of Crete that date back at least 130,000 years ago. But Crete has been an island for more than five million years. So the archaeologists are saying this is good evidence of early seafaring uh, in the Mediterranean. And this would have been have been done by African people. These were the only people on the face of the earth, okay, uh, dating back 130,000 years ago. This article on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. This is from the New York Times, February 15th, uh, 2010. We look at discoveries like uh, the, the discovery of the lost city of Egypt, Thomas Heraklion. There are two lost cities of Egypt that we look at, Thomas Heraklion, but also Dazzling Aten, which was discovered a couple of years ago, about 2021, Dazzling Aten. Uh, it's another lost city of Egypt. Uh, this article here from uh, Yahoo News, April 30th, 2013, Sunken Egyptian City Reze Reveals 1,200-Year-Old Secrets. And the UK publication, The Telegraph, reports that 150 feet beneath the surface of Egypt's Bay of Abu Kir, they found 60, 64 ships, 16-foot-tall statues, 700 anchors, countless gold coins, and smaller artifacts. Frank Gadillo was the lead archaeologist on this expedition. Uh, he estimates that Thomas Heraklion was built around 8th century BCE, before the Common Era. So these are some of the statues that they found buried at the bottom uh, of the sea, all right? And this documents uh, this African presence. Uh, so we get into uh, understanding what culture is. Uh, we look at uh, the co-op systems that African people um, had, uh, African Americans had here in America, like the Color Merchants Association, Free African Society. We look at some of our uh, some of our history uh, in cooperative economics because this is coming back in favor again. There's an article from uh, ABCNews.com: Mutual aid networks find roots in communities of color. Mutual aid networks find roots in communities of color. Um, and then also there was a piece from the uh, vice.com uh, and they interviewed uh, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhard, uh, how black co-ops can fight institutional racism, how black co-ops can fight institutional racism. And this is from vice.com, uh, August 9th, uh, 2016. Uh, and Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhard said, uh, so the co-ops had, so how do co-ops function in a capitalistic system? She said the co-ops has the uh, has the factories, does all the production, does all of the marketing, handles the business side that frees the farmers up to do their dairy farming, knowing that they have a market. Individually, they would not be able to afford a production plant or, or afford all of the advertising. But owning it all together, the individual farmers can now afford to compete. So she was talking about land of lakes, land of lakes. OK, Land of Lakes is a uh, cooperative. Uh, we have examples all over the world. And sometimes how that looks is it's a small enterprise that allows smaller individuals to compete. Take a group like Land of Lakes, which is one of our largest agricultural corporations. It is actually a cooperative of dairy farmers that all own Land of Lakes together equally. And Land of Lakes buys its milk and produces all the dairy products. OK, uh, so we look at other archaeological discoveries like the one coming out of Morocco in 20, June 2017, which uh, they found remains of Homo sapiens, modern man dating back 300,000 to 350,000 years ago. Uh, the earliest previous Homo sapien bones uh, date back. Uh, uh, date back 195,000 years ago. Uh, and this was found in Ethiopia, clear across the continent. OK. And once again, when they when these discoveries take place, they're causing the archaeologists, the pa paleontologists, the scientists to push the timelines back and realize that all of this is older than we thought. Uh, there was the discovery from April 26, 2017, Mastodon bone findings could upend our understanding of human history, okay? And paleontologists in California 
dug up um, a 130,000 year old mastodon, a, a, a 130,000 year old mastodon skeleton that according to paleontologists, looks like it was smashed apart by humans. But they found this skeleton in America where people were not supposed to have arrived for over 100,000 years. Okay, so the Clovis culture, which dates back to uh, about 13,000 BC or so in Clovis, New Mexico, is said to be the oldest settlement or oldest evidence of humans here in America, and that's of Native Americans. Now, when this article came out from NBC News and other news outlets had reporting on this discovery, I sent this to Dr. David M. Hotel, and we and we discussed it because. Uh, if this is true, and if humans did break apart this Mastodon skeleton 130,000 years ago, well, this confirms this African presence here going back tens of thousands of years, even before Native Americans existed. All right. Uh, so we talk about the Olmecs and the uh, Mandinka, Egyptian Olmec connection, because the Olmecs, uh, which uh, are in uh, Mexico, which were in Mexico, uh, going back to about 1500 BC or so, around that period of time, this was a mixture of uh, Africa. This was a mix mixture of ancient Egyptians, the Mandinka from West Africa, and Native Americans. Uh, Dr. David M. Hotep talks about this as well as um, Renoko Rashidi talks about them uh, as well in the article that Renoko wrote for uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com that we cite, but. Uh, Dr. David M. Hotep on page, on page 82 of not of um, the first Americans with Africans documented evidence said a major ethnic group among the ancient Egyptian Nubians were the Manding people, an original Niger Congo homeland in the general vicinity of the Upper Nile is probably as good a hypothesis as any for the origin of the Manding. The proto-Manding migration had to have taken place during the African aqualithic period. That was a wet period in Africa that lasted thousands of years at a time when the Sahara was fertile and had river systems and great lakes. Uh, the Nile flowed, uh, what would the Nile flow from south to north and emptied into the Atlantic Ocean during very ancient times. This would have enabled East Africans direct access to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the uh, longer route would be to sail the Nile River north to the Mediterranean and then head west to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, when the Manding reached Central America and began mixing with the local population, they were labeled Omecs. The Omecs were supposedly a mixture of the Manding or Mandinka the Amer Amerians or American Indians. Do not forget that the Manding made up the base of the Omex. So the Egyptians, the Manding, and the base of the Omex are related to each other. That's from page 82 of um, the First Americans with Africans documented evidence. We deal with um, the Druids and St. Patrick in Ireland and how the Druids are dealing with a watered down teaching. Uh, coming out of ancient Kemen, ancient Egypt. We look at the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors and uh, the Spanish Grenadan uh, War in uh, 1492 and the Moors losing control of their last stronghold of, Gren of Granada, January 2nd, uh, 1492. Okay. Uh, we, we, deal with all, we deal with all of that history. Uh, we look at ancient civilizations like Nubia, um, uh, Ta-Nehisi, ancient Kemet, uh, uh, Carthage and the Carthaginian Wars and um, Hannibal Barca. Uh, we look at uh, Egypt, what's known as Egypt of the West and the African influence here in America. Uh, the Tekken is an ancient African symbol that comes from the mythology of Asar, Aset and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis and Horus. Um, there were about 1,200 Tekkenu all throughout ancient Kemet. Today, they're less than a dozen. There are three um, ancient Tekkenu or obelisks 
that were taken from Egypt and they were taken into London, England, New York City, and Paris, France. Ancient Egyptians called obelisk Tekkenu, and they were also used to tell the time in the past. Their, uh, 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 their pinnacles were basically covered in gold to reflect the sunlight. Historians say the obelisks represented uh, immortality and eternity and their long structure helped connect the heavens and the earth. Currently, Cleopatra's needle is the name given to the three ancient Egyptian obelisks, one in New York City, one in London, England, one in Paris, France, okay? There's an article called Cleopatra's Needle, how three ancient Egyptian obelisks ended up in New York City, London, and Paris, France from facetofaceafrica.com. Check that out. So we talk about the first holy trinity of Asar, Aset, and Heru. Some of this information may go outside the circumference of your own awareness. Just because you never heard it before, disagree with it, does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. The Greeks called them Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Um, there were approximately 1,200 Tekkenu built in, in ancient Kemen and ancient times, but only about a dozen are found in Egypt today. Many of the Tekkenu removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New York, New York, uh, Rome, Italy, and Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The Tekkenu are now called obelisks by their new owners, and few people know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king Asar. Uh, who the Greeks called Osiris, page 17 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. And I just interviewed, interviewed Tony Browder uh, in April of 2023. We talked about uh, why Nile Valley civilization history is so important. Now, the word Mason, M-A-S-O-N, is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So the book Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder is one of the books we use in the class as well. Uh, we also use uh, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization uh, as well. We use that also, okay? Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, uh, Egypt on the Potomac. Uh, we use one of um, Renoko Rashidi's book, books, Black Star, The African Presence in Early Europe. So you don't have to buy any of these books. We show you the text right on the screen, okay? For most of these books. You can get them for your own personal library if you want to, but you don't uh, have to feel the need to purchase the books just to follow along in class. All right, now, let's continue here. Um, Masonic temples are, th so the, the concept of going to an institution of higher learning and getting your credentials in a series of, of steps or degrees, that comes out of the Nile Valley region of Africa. That, that, that comes out of ancient Kemet in the Nile Valley region of Africa. That comes from us. All right, so uh, oftentimes when I hear people say, well, college is not for me and things like this. I mean, we created the first institutions of higher learning that modern colleges are patterned after and influenced by. And then when we look at the universities that existed in Europe, University of Tolo uh, Toledo, University of Barcelona, uh, University of Salamanca in Spain, they're going to be either built by African Moors or heavily influenced by the teachings, by the teachings of the Moors. And a lot of their first professors are going to be African Moors also. Now, Masonic temples are considered houses of light or temples of learning. The term Mason or child of light is, is a direct reference to the highest degree of the comedic education system. The 33 degrees of instruction within Freemasonry represent a fraction of the 360 degrees of instruction that comprised the comedic system of education. 
yet with less than 10% of the wisdom of ancient Kemet, Freemasons have held positions of influence and power throughout the world for over 200 years. Read page 33 of uh, Egypt on the Potomac by uh, Tony Browder. So uh, we deal with going from uh, the, the virgin Alset, who gives birth to the baby Heru on December 25th, to the worship of the Black Madonna and Child, which was worshipped all throughout Europe. The Black Madonna and Child was worshipped all throughout Europe. And probably the, the, the European country that has the greatest representation of the Black Madonna and Child would be France, with about 300 representations, statues and paintings of the Black Madonna and Child. We, we look at some of the uh, deities, some of the Netaru coming out of ancient Kemet, uh, Ma'at as well. We look at things like the Judgment Scene, uh, that includes uh, Anpu and uh, Dehuti, uh, also Asar, who sits on the throne of judgment. So we go through and look at history. We look at things like uh, uh, historical figures like Bishop Nicholas, who uh, becomes a saint. And Bishop Nicholas was of African descent. And Bishop Nicholas was the real life inspiration for uh, the secular character of Santa Claus, which comes from the mythological character also of center class center class means saint nicholas in dutch and center class we see uh is worshiped is is revered uh, amongst the dutch we see uh, see this in holland and in the netherlands and there's a celebration of uh center class in the beginning of november okay and it goes through december and they commemorate uh, center class along with Joata Piet, who was a Moor. Joata Piet means Black Pete in Dutch. It commemorates center class coming in from Spain on a steamship, a steamboat with Joata Piet, Black Pete. Okay. So this once again also deals with the history of the Moors throughout Europe. We look at why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th, because nowhere in the biblical text does it it does the state that Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, was born on December 25th. Um, we look at the film Black Panther. The film Black Panther deals with African culture, African history, African language, African spiritual systems. And the Panther deity Bast, uh, uh, who watches over the people of Wakanda, uh, and we know in ancient Kemet, uh, cats were looked at as a protector. Well, the panther deity Bast comes from the Netter or the goddess Bastet that was worshipped in ancient uh, in ancient Egypt, uh, especially during the second dynasty around 2890 BCE before the Common Era. And she was worshipped in the form of a lioness at first and then later as a cat. She, she was the goddess of warfare in lower Kemet, uh, lower Egypt. Uh, and the film Black Panther incorporates 11 different African cultures. We see different African deities represented in the uh, Black Panther comic book and in the uh, um, nation of Wakanda, the fictitious nation of Wakanda. Now, when we look at Wakandan religion and its tribes, the religion of the Wakandan people first developed during the pilgrimage to the land. In their conflict, the originators, uh, who were the gods of Wakanda, formed from the heroes of humans within the tribe. Ascending to the status of a god, these heroes became the Orisha. The, uh, now, the Orisha are the names of the deities in the uh, spiritual system practiced by the Yoruba in in present-day Nigeria, was present-day Nigeria, and that's the spiritual system of Ifa, okay? So the Orisha, these are emissaries, these are um, deities, and they're helpers of the supreme being in Ifa, known as Olodu Mare. But the, uh, these heroes in, in Wakanda became known as the Orisha, or Orisha, taking the names of Koku, Thoth, which Thoth uh, was the Greek named for Dahuti, uh, Bast or Bastet, Mojaji, Pata. Pata is the uh, creator um, in the uh, in ancient Kemet, uh, the, the, the Netter, 
that's looked at as the creator, Pata and Niami. The Orishas or Orishas origins date back to the ancient Egyptian beings known as the Ennead. Well, Ennead in Greek means nine, and Ennead refers to the original nine Orisha, okay? Oh, I'm sorry, the original nine Netaru in ancient Kemet. Now, in addition to the development of these gods, the people of Wakanda became segmented into various cults that worshiped various animal deities of the area. The most famous cults included the Black Panther cult and the White Gorilla cult. So um, Umbaku is from, in the movie, Umbaku is from the White Gorilla cult. The 18 tribes, because there are 18 different tribes that make up the people of Wakanda. The 18 tribes in total developed into developed in the, in the country and include the Lion cult, Crocodile cult, and Hyena cult. The Ennead, uh, Ennead means group of nine in Greek. In ancient Kemet, they were called the Pesjet, the Pesjet. The nine Neturu were Atum, which, rep which was the sun, At Atum, or Atum, Atum, uh, or you may see Aten, um, Shu, which means air, Tefnut, moisture, Geb was earth, and Nut, sky, Asar, who the Greeks called Osiris, Aset, who the Greeks called Isis, Seth, and Nephetus. These were the original nine Neturu or the Ennead, okay? One of the books we use in the class is also Ancient Egypt by Lorna Oakes and Lucia Galen, all right? Uh, pages 274 through 277, they lay out uh, a lot of the different Neturu or deities in ancient Kemet and their attributes, their attributes. So we deal with Hannibal Barca, the Battle of Kanai 216 BC, um, the Punic Wars, all different types of history like that. Carthage, uh, which is from 813 BCE to 146 because Carthage is destroyed, 146 BC because Carthage is destroyed by Rome. Um, we deal with uh, ancient Nubia, uh, as well, which is about 4,500 BC to uh, uh, 500 AD, uh, ancient Nubia. And we go through and look at this history chronologically. There's a timeline of history that we look at. And we look at what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. You have to study the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, which begins in 711 AD uh, when uh, the African Moors going from Morocco into the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal, led by uh, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad. Okay, and then we go through and analyze the transatlantic slave trade uh, as well. And, and Christopher Columbus is crucial to understanding the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade and his uh, four voyages. Uh, and he says, sell August 3rd, 1492 on the Nina and the Penta and Santa Maria. Um, and this is uh, the same year, uh, uh, some months after the uh, African Moors are expelled, okay? Uh, they lose control of their last stronghold, which was Granada, January 2nd, 1492. Uh, African slaves were first brought to the New World shortly after its discovery by or uncovery and colonization by Christopher Columbus. Um, and they could be found, Africans could be found on the island of Hispaniola, a site of present day Haiti as early as 1501. Upon his arrival in the Bahamas, uh, he lands in the Bahamas October 12, 1492. Columbus himself captures seven of the natives for, quote unquote, their education on his return to Spain. However, the slave trade proper, um, According to a lot of sources, they look at the slave trade, what they call the slave trade proper, beginning in 1518, when the first direct black cargo from Africa landed in the West Indies. Now, that, that's referring to the Asiento de Negros, signed by King Charles V of Spain, August of 1518, which gave a license to slave trading nations and slave trading countries to uh, provide Spanish colonies and Spain with enslaved Africans. Now, the importation of African slaves to work in the Americas was the inspiration of the Spanish bishop, Bartolomeu de las Casas, whose support of black slavery was motivated by humanitarian concerns. Bartolomeu de las Casas argued that the enslavement of Africans and even some whites 
proving that in the early period, slavery did not operate according to exclusive racial demarcations. He argued that enslaving Africans as opposed to Native Americans would save the indigenous American Indian populations, which were not only dying out, but engaging in large scale resistance as they opposed their excessively harsh condition, conditions. As a result, King Charles V, who was then King of Spain, agreed to the Asiento de Negros, or slave trading license. He signed this in August of 1518, which later represented the most coveted prize in European wars as it gave to those who possessed it a monopoly in slave trafficking. Now, the widespread expansion of the oceanic slave trade can be attributed to the enormous labor demanded by sugarcane, one of the first and most successful agricultural crops to be cultivated by African slaves. The earliest lucrative Spanish sugar plantations were in the Caribbean and West Indies on the islands of Haiti, Cuba, and Jamaica, while Portugal controlled large areas of Brazil. However, Spanish and Portuguese domination of the slave trade was soon challenged by other Europeans, including the British. One of the earliest adventurers, Sir John Hawkins, undertook his first voyage between 1562 and 1563 as a direct consequence of his gains and was knighted by Queen Elizabeth I. Okay, so this is just a sample of the type of information we get deep into in this 12-week online course uh, that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, uh, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, uh, so we, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, um, all of this. I share uh, excerpts of interviews I've done with uh, the historian, with the scholars uh, as well. You can, if you learn anything from this broadcast, from this brief preview, Register for the 12 week online course at our website, uh, the African History Network.com. The African History Network.com. As soon as you register, you can start watching content. Our next class is uh, Saturday, July 15th, 2023, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You do not have to be in class live, you don't, have, you don't have to be in class when we're live. We do the sessions live, then all the sessions are archived. So, because we record all the sessions. Uh, about 10 minutes after we finish the class, it's available to watch on replay, all right? So as soon as you register, you can watch the class we did July 8th and the class we did July 1st, all right? And then Sundays, I teach uh, Black Resistance Movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, okay, uh, 1800 to 1968. If you want to um, register for... If you want to pay for the classes through Cash App, you can do that. Just email me to let me know what the money's for, okay? Uh, it's because I need to know what it's for. I need to know because and, and if I if you want me to register you in the class, I need your email address also. All right, so uh, you can email us at ahn show at the African History Network dot com or just click right here on the website contact the African History Network. We have our PayPal Cash App information here. Uh, click on it. This helps us keep doing the research as well. Yeah, our official cash app tag is dollar sign the AHN show S H O W. When you go to it, it says Michael. These other ones here, I've identified five fake African History Network accounts. I'm trying to sh uh, shut down. Uh, cash app is not cooperating with me. I launched um, an investigation. I had them launch an investigation late last year. I have to follow with them again because they don't get back with me. Okay. They, they, I don't know what the problem is with Cash App. Um, they, they have like really poor customer service when it comes to, uh, investigating fake accounts that have been set up. All right. But we have that information here at our website, the African History Network.com. All right. Look, we have to get out of here. Remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating and empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. Hopefully you learned something from today, uh, today's uh, radio show, uh, our show, as well as this preview of this 12-week on, uh, online course that I teach. Be sure to register for the online class. Also follow us on our fan page, The African History Network. Give us a thumbs up on this broadcast. Follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, on um on YouTube as well, and my uh, personal 
Facebook page, um, Michael M. Hotep on Facebook, and as well as the Michael M. Hotep show. That's our other Facebook page, okay? Remember, right now is correct, wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever, and we'll talk.